All right, so let's take a look at Quiz Team Trick last Friday. Um, the average on that was uh, it was pretty good. Now, if it was seven points, seventeen point seven six and twenty three, that wouldn't be very special. But remember, a three point bonus. So really, it was seventeen point seven six out of twenty and eighteen. So this was, you know, pretty close to an 89%, which is pretty strong. Um, but, uh, but definitely a number of questions missed. And so it was worth, uh, you know, all you, all you folks that were missing uh, anywhere from three, four, five problems. Uh, probably want to pay attention and see what you can learn from going through these, uh, these problems. Only one of them was a real issue overall. Problem number eight. Like only six people got that right, so that's a, obviously a pretty low percentage. Um, so we'll definitely have to take a look at eight. Uh, problem number one, I would say most of you guys probably got this as a direct application of theorem uh, 10 9, which tells you that if you have a right triangle inscribed in a circle, the hypotenuse has to be a diameter. And sure enough, it tells us we have a right triangle inscribed in a circle. And so the hypotenuse has to be a diameter, right? There's the right angle, and here is your hypotenuse. However, what if you forgot that theorem? Well, you could still easily uh, get this one right by just extending the right angle into an inscribed angle, since it is an inscribed angle. Um, I believe that the inscribed angle relationship 10 7 is that an inscribed angle is half the arc that it intercepts or vice versa would be the arc is twice the inscribed angle and so this uh, this arc that we have out here would have to be double 90 degrees which of course is 180 degrees well 180 degrees by definition is uh, is a yeah, semicircle only thing that can create a semicircle is a diameter. So uh, that's another way you can afford to way to that answer. Um, everybody agrees with me on that one, so good job. Right on. Uh, number two, um, a regular octagon is inscribed in a circle. All right, so you definitely had to know that an octagon had eight sides. Um, if you're trying to draw this one out, you can probably realize it's not very fun to try to draw a regular octagon. It might be a little tricky. But, um, but if you knew that regular meant all equal uh, angles, all congruent angles, all congruent sides, and you remembered that theorem 10.3 told us that um, congruent chords intersect congruent arcs, and congruent arcs determine congruent chords. And each of these chords, really, you know, all you'll do is kind of just focus in on one, right, and those chords. Um, each of these chords is intersecting a congruent arc. So 360 degrees in the entire circle, eight congruent chords going around, makes you do 45 degrees each. And I think you guys probably figured that out because you guys all got it right. Sweet. Um, here is a double whammy. We've got a central angle uh, called A, and an inscribed angle called B, and they both intersect a chord or an arc, I should say, um, that is 86 degrees in measure. So um, what we know is we know that a central angle has a one-to-one -one relationship. This was not like a theorem or anything or even a definition. It was just a key concept from section 10.1. The measure of a minor arc is the measure of its central angle. Um, so closer, closer to a definition than anything. On the other hand, inscribed angles, as we've already talked about um, in, in this presentation, is half of the arc that is intercepted. And so um, A would have to be the same as the arc, 86, and B would have to be half the arc, which would be 43. And you get to an A and a T. So A and B. And, uh, most of you guys agreed. Everybody got A right. I think just a couple people forgot to also select B. This was not a multiple choice. It was a multiple select. So anytime you see the direction select all 
answers. Make sure you don't stop at the first correct thing that was right. But uh, but definitely a, a solid uh, problem. Um, number four is going to uh, have us once again apply 10.3, which tells us that congruent chords intersect congruent arcs. And knowing that, I know that DP and DI are congruent chords. And so arcs, DP and arcs, DI have to be congruent arcs. Um, subtracting those from one. Uh, from 360 for the full circle leaves us 120. Now, what this means is that this uh, triangle is not just isosceles, it's actually an equilateral triangle. And you could certainly take half of 120 to get, you know, angle D, but you could also just have remembered that equilateral triangles are also equiangular, and they always have only 60 degree angles in them. Um, but what this does is it leaves us with only two possible answers right off the bat. Um, only two of these responses have the correct angle for angle IDP. What we still need to determine is the correct um, measure for arc D, P, I. And so if you, if you look at uh, the arcs, 20 plus 120 is 240, so that gives you a C, C for the right answer. And 21 of uh, 25 of you got that one correct, so it's 84%, uh, percent, which is pretty good. If you missed it, um, you might want to think about what part of it you might have um, you know, got wrong. Um, number five, uh, primarily I think we're going to use Theorem 1010 because we have a, an inscribed quadrilateral. And Theorem 1010 tells us that inscribed quadrilaterals have opposite angles that are supplementary. But we're also going to probably borrow some help from 10.7 again. 10.7 is a really important theorem in this, in this chapter because it's that one to two inscribed angle relationship. And here's what I think I would do. I think I would start with X. I think you could get X uh, pretty quickly because it's connected to 77. So um, it doesn't look like this angle right here is going to be very much help. But it is opposite of 72. So that actually means that it's supplementary to 72 and so 108. I can then use this inscribed angle. That's where the you know that's where the theorem 107 comes in. To double to project this arc right here to be uh, 216 degrees, 108 times 2. And then I can just subtract the 77 from the 216. Okay? And that's where the 139 comes from. Um, so knowing that tells me that I can only have either C or D as my answer. But to get Y, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. Um, I would probably, actually, now that we have the 139, I think that the, the quickest way to do this is to just go ahead and use this 102 degree angle. Because if you double 102, you're going to end up with um, 204, right? 204 degrees. And if you do 204 and you subtract the 139, that will give you what is left over for Y. It turns out it's 65, not 6. Even though Y is a small arc, 6 is a really small measurement. And so you could probably, if you got the 139 right, you probably could have guessed your way to D. And I think, um, I don't know if you guys had to guess or not, but y'all got it right. So nice. Whoa. Um, all right, this is the first time we have to apply theorem 10.6, which tells us that congruent chords are equidistant from the center of a circle. And if um, and if two chords are equidistant, they must be congruent. So in this case, um, we do have uh, equidistant arcs. Um, they're both 12 units away. I know these are distances because of the perpendicular distances, uh, the perpendicular signs. Remember, distance from a point to a line has to be perpendicular path, but based on our theorem, I know that the, the arc lengths have to be equal because the arcs are congruent. So I'm just going to set these arc lengths equal to each other and then do a little algebra, right? Subtract 6x, add 14, I think you're going to get 3x equals 18, so x is 6, and um, Oh, 21. So 84% of you guys uh, got that. So not bad. Not bad at all. We'll take that, right? Um, number seven, we're going to go back to 1010 again, which is the uh, 
opposite angles of a quadrilateral are, um, are, are supplementary. And so 3x and 14 are opposite angles. And so I, I need to create a supplementary relationship with those. Uh, let's subtract the 114. Let's divide by 3. And it looks like x has the value of 22. And um, yeah, once again, 84% of you guys uh, agreed with that. So looks pretty good. Um, all right, finally, we get to 8, which was the one where only 6, I think, if I remember, people uh, got this one all the way right. Now, my guess is a lot of you guys got part of this right, but only 6 people got it right in its entirety. Um, boy, this is one where you've really just got to have to um, go through these one at a time and check them and, uh, you know, don't jump to conclusions. Um, and use your use your theorems accordingly. I think the first four of them um, are just talking about inscribed angles, and I know that because you know if I look at D and C and B, I'm just looking at the vertex, the middle letter, the vertices A, D. You know those are all these points on the circle. And so you know these would have to be inscribed angles if the vertices are on the circle. Okay. Now, when I get to the last one, it's a mix of inscribed angles because points D and C are on the circle. But look at vertex X. X is the center. So the last two are going to use central angles a little bit. And we'll have to take a look at those when we get there. Um, let's go ahead and just uh, walk through this one at a time and see if we can make some adjustments from, um, from this quiz. C, D, B. So from C to D. To B. Now, if you just want to know what arc is being intercepted, you can kind of just look at the, the C and the B um, to see that information. But um, but drawing it out is always safer. Um, and then the other angle is ADB. So from A to D to B. So both of these angles have the same vertex, but um, they do not intersect the same arc. And other than that, I really don't see a relationship between them. So there's nothing that indicates to me that they might be congruent. And so I would not go with A. I do not think A gives us enough information to believe those are congruent. Let's go to B. Um, B, D, A. We'll go from B to D to A. All right, so that's this arc right here. And then... Uh, Angle A, C, B goes from A to C and then to B. Now notice that uh, in this case, they are intersecting the same arc. Okay. Angle C down here is intersecting the arc AB, and um, angle D over here is intersecting the same arc. And this is a direct application of theorem 10.8, which tells us that any two inscribed angles that intercept the same arc must be congruent. Now, if you didn't know that, you could still reason that angles D and C have to be half of arc AB. And since AB has the same measurement, it's reflexive. You, you divide the same number by 2, you're going to get the same answer. And that's kind of how we prove theorem 10.8 from theorem 10.7 in the first place. But uh, regardless, B is looking pretty good. Now, I could have kind of reasoned this out by looking at the endpoints, you know, B and A and A and D. They both have the same arc endpoints. You have to kind of confirm that C and D are on the same, um, you know, on the same arc. So they're either both on the minor arc or both on the major arc or on the same side of a semicircle if it's divided evenly. But um, but you at least know they have the same endpoints. So it's not a fail-safe way of doing it, but it is a helpful way of, uh, of kind of trying to compare them. So be careful, but it's a, it is a little quicker to, to kind of look at it that way. Well, let's keep going. Um, a, B, D. You can go A, B, This angle right here, and so we're intersecting arc DA, and then 
I'm ready to come right back and do A, C, D. A, C, D. Oh, look at that. That, um, that angle. And you'll see down here if you go up and look at what it's intersecting. It's intersecting the same arc. And so it'll right back to theorem uh, 10 8. If two inscribed angles intersect the same arc, they are congruent. Okay. Um, finally, we consider BAC. So from D to A to C. And so that is this arc here. And then um, it's angle that's being compared is CDA. So that's from C to D to A. So notice that um, notice that these two angles both use the same three letters, but because the vertex is different, um, you know, we're talking about different angles and different intercepted arcs. Um, although it kind of looks like these are know fairly close in size there's an absolutely no way of comparing them for sure um, yeah they're, they're, they're gonna be close they're gonna be close it looks like not exactly the same the green one looks like it's just a tad bit bigger but um, there's there's no, no no given information that would indicate that those are the same based on the information that's given they don't intercept the same part so we can't assume that to be true um, just as a quick example of, uh, of when you can't use the endpoints uh, to, to verify that two arcs are congruent, um, like what if one of the what if one of the inscribed angles was ADC, which would be this arc, right? Intercept arc AC. And then um, what if the other one was um, ABC? So this angle. So this angle would intercept this humongous ADC major arc. And so even though the endpoints of these two arcs are the same, A and C, we're getting opposite angles. And so the arcs would probably add up to 360, and the angles would be supplementary, but they wouldn't be congruent. So that's why you can't just go on the endpoints alone. But if the endpoints don't match up, you probably do not have um, arcs that are congruent. All right, to finish this off, we now have to compare um, inscribed angles to central angles. Now, I notice right away that, you know, D and A, D and A, these two angles have the same um, arc endpoints. They're going to intersect the same arc. And sure enough, when I draw DXA, I get a central angle that intersects arc DA, and when I come back and draw angle DCA, DCA, I get an inscribed angle that intersects that same arc. And so we, we definitely have a relationship. I would say that the, uh, the inscribed angle was half of the central angle, right? Uh, because angle C is half of this arc, and angle X is exactly equal to this arc. Well, that's not what the statement says. The statement says that I would need to take two right, of these to get one of these. That That's backwards. I'd have to take one half of DXA to get to angle C. So I'd either need to move two to the other side or turn that two into a one half to make this a true statement. So E is not true uh, based on that. Now, on the other hand, if you go to last answer, F, and you see that CXB intersects arc CB, and then you compare that to DDX, so from B to D to X, hey, look at that, we both intersect the same arc, don't we? So once again, I know that angle X is two times bigger than angle D, and that's exactly what this statement is telling me. It's telling me that I would need two angle D's, two of these, to make one of the larger central angle. And that's, uh, that's exactly that statement. So that's why F was true. 
um, and that goes back to um, well, that goes back to theorem you know, 10 7 that the mean described angle is half of the arc. Um, so for four of these, we really needed to know angle theorem 10 8, which arcs inscribed inside the same arc are congruent, but our angles inscribed inside the same arc are congruent. But, but uh, B, C, and F, here's the good news. The good news is that those were the most popular answers. Uh, you can see those green bars are out there. But um, even the furthest one out, only 19 out of 25 got 76%. And, and for some reason, C, which really was the same as B, only about half of you guys got that right. But when you wanted to know who got you know B and C and F all at the same time, it dropped all the way down to C. So this was a tough question. Yes, um, you can see a little, a little rough, a little rough, but I hope you learned something from doing it. All right, problems 9 and 10 both revolve around this proof. And I know it's been a while since you've done a proof, and, uh, but overall, you guys did solid on it. Um, you know, most people were getting them right, but some people just need to think through it a little bit more logically. Now, this is, uh, this is half of theorem 10.3, which tells us that if you have congruent chords in a circle, the arcs are congruent, and, and then it's an if and only if, so if the arcs are congruent, the chords are congruent. This goes in from the chords to the arcs. And so they're going to start us off given-wise with you know, a couple of congruent um, uh, chords. And then if you, if you follow the proof, they're going to immediately follow that up by saying, hey, because you can always connect to any two points with a line, why don't we draw all these radii? And by the definition of radii, step three, um, we know those are all congruent. So they give you uh, the first you know, three steps of this proof. And then they kind of want you to, to share some of the work from that point on. And so um, by the time we get to step four, here's what we know. We know I have congruent chords, and we know I have uh, four congruent um, radii. And so they want me to, to explain why triangle CSH, uh, don't we miss CSH right now? CSH is a congruent triangle, triangle PS. Why would those two triangles be congruent? Well, let's look at the information, right? I've got uh, three corresponding congruent sides here to here. And so that's going to be three sides, SSS. Most of you guys did pick D and got this right. Now there were a couple of you guys that picked, I think E, and that would have that would have made you have to have an angle SAS, and that's that's the problem with um, that's the problem with the proof up to this point. If you look at what we know so far based on what they gave us, these are line segments. These are all line segments. And so you can't use SAS if you never have a, a congruent angle identified. And we never were given a congruent angle. So for those of you that, that chose, um, you know, I think uh, number letter E, SAS, or even 21, you know, ASA, you can't use those if you don't have angles that have been brought up in your proof. Now, if you chose one of these three, A, B, or C, that's a, that's a slightly larger issue because, um, you know, the isosceles uh, triangle theorem tells us that the base angles on the isosceles triangle are congruent. It doesn't say anything about the triangles being congruent. It just says base angles of an isosceles triangle are congruent. They want to know why triangles are congruent. Only the triangle congruency theorems, which are these guys, and um, AAS also works. Um, HL if it's a right triangle. Those are the only four ways we know. Um, this is not one of them. So this, uh, you know, this really doesn't make any sense. Um, the equidistant congruent chords theorem from this chapter tells us that, you know, if you have con congruent chords, they have to be equidistant from the center of the circle. But it has nothing to do with with congruent triangles. Inscribed quadrilaterals has to do with quadrilaterals, not triangles. And it tells us the opposite angles of an inscribed quadrilateral are 
supplementary. It doesn't have anything to do with congruent quadrilaterals or congruent triangles. So if you picked one of these, I just don't think you were really thinking about what they wanted you to know. You really have to be a little more logical. What tells me that triangles are congruent? We studied it first semester. There's only four theorems plus one special HL theorem for right triangles, okay? But uh, the answer on this one was definitely uh, D. And most of you guys, 18, which is 72% agreed. Um, which, you know, we haven't done proofs in a while, so it's not too bad, but you can see he's not super excited there. And I do think that once you think through it, um, the seven of you that picked either A, B, or E may understand why your answers didn't make sense. Now, the last uh, problem, uh, 10, is right along the same lines, right? Now that we have these congruent triangles, um, why are the uh, arcs CH uh, and P, uh, I congruent. What would help us to get to that point? So um, we now know we have these congruent triangles. What relates from the triangles to the arcs? We know that CPCTC, which they're, they're telling us this is what we have to use, tells me that corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. What parts are going to help me? Um, we we really only have angles left, right? We've already used all of the congruent line segments, so none of that is even worth bringing up because that's known information. So let's consider the angles. Like, for example, angle C and angle P are corresponding angles, but do they relate to the pink arcs? You know, angle H corresponds with angle I, but do those relate to the pink arcs? The one that you're really after here are the central angles. Angle um, CSH and angle PSI are central angles that intersect the arcs we're trying to prove that are congruent. So if, if those central angles are equal in measure and, and then thus congruent, um, those arcs have to have the same measure. They have to be congruent also. And so that's really what I'm trying to find here with the CPCTC. Um, so CSP angle CSP this little angle right here, that's not going to help us at all. Uh, let's go to B. H, S, C. H, S, C. So this is one of those central angles. I, S, P. I, S, P. Yep, there it is. So that's the one right there. Those are the two central angles that can directly relate to those intercepted arcs. Okay. How many of you guys um, got it be on that one? Um, actually, one more than on the last question. So 19 of you, which is pretty good. If you were one of the six people that picked C, D, or E, um, I just want you to think about why those pieces of information don't relate to those arcs and aren't going to help us. Um, you know, so, hey, you haven't done a proof in a while. Um, certainly 76% isn't anything to get too excited about, which is why, you know, we're kind of meh. But um, on, the other, on the other side, you know, we haven't done some uh, proofs really since last semester. So, um, yeah, we'll take it, right? Not too bad. Now, the good news is that um, the bonus was pretty strong. It's actually interesting because it's the same exact setup, the exact same setup that I gave you, the same three points on the last quiz I gave you, T at negative 5, 2. So that would have been right around this point right here. I gave you um, N at... 7, negative 10. So that would have been in this vicinity right here. And then finally, I gave you the center of the circle. So the center of circle A is A, which was at 4, 1. So over 4, down 1. So right around that, that spot right there. Okay? And a circle would contain those two points. And if I, you know, do it somewhat accurately, it should be kind of close. I don't know. And I think I put this point way out there too, probably too far to really be five units over. But that's kind of what the picture would look like. So just a, a reminder, on the last quiz, I asked you to try to find the slope or the equation, I should say, of this tangent line. Because we had a... Uh, theorem, a new theorem that was telling us 
that you know you had a perpendicular relationship between radii drawn to points of tangency. But we're not going to do that this time. This time, instead, I'm asking you to find the equation of the line that is perpendicular to chord T and N. So through T and N, or connecting T and N is a chord line segment with both points on a circle. I want you to find the equation this time of the line that's perpendicular to that. Now, remember, there's infinitely many lines perpendicular through that line segment. Any of these lines right here, you know, would be perpendicular, but we want the one that contains the diameter. That means it has to go through point A, okay? And so this is an application of a theorem we haven't used yet on this quiz, 10, 4, 10, 5, which kind of go together, specifically in this case, 10, 5. If a diameter of a circle is perpendicular to a chord, then it must bisect the arc. Because they told me that this was going to be a perpendicular relationship. So right off the bat, I have some, some information that I've learned in this class that can help me figure out the, the correct slope. The slope of chord Tn is y minus y over x minus x or 12 over negative 12. So that's a negative 1, right? Well, the perpendicular slope then has to be the opposite reciprocal. And 1 and negative 1 are the only numbers that are kind of their own reciprocals. Um, you know, the opposite of 12 over negative 12 would be negative 12 over 12, which would still be 1. But remember, it has to be the opposite reciprocal, the opposite negative is positive, so our slope is 1. Um, but I don't have a point. I don't have a point, or do I? And this is where we know that it goes, it has to, if it's a diameter, it has to contain A. It has to go through the point, you know, 4, negative 1. And so uh, I could do Y equals MX plus B. Negative 1 is the Y value, 1 is the slope. 4 is the x value, and um, if I subtract 4 to solve for b, I get negative 5, and so my equation would be y equals 1x, or just x minus 5. Now, just to give you a variation of this, I also know that it has to be a perpendicular bisector, so I know that um, it's got to go through this midpoint. So if I found the midpoint, of, um, of Tn, it would be negative 5 plus 7 over 2, 2 plus negative 12 over 2, 2 plus 10 over 2. So it's 2 over 2 is 1, and negative 8 over 2 is negative 4. So this is the point um, that it hits the chord at when it bisects the chord. Well, let's check this out. If I did negative 4 is the y value, right, equals the slope is still 1, times the x value, which is also 1, plus b. So if I subtract 1 from each side here, notice how I get the exact same intercept that I got the other way, right? And so that's, uh, that's, the, that's the trick. Um, Knowing your relationships and remembering the algebra that we reviewed in the fall. Now, just because there's a lot of variations uh, of this equation, I did accept some different forms. I did accept, I did accept 1x minus 5, negative 5 plus x, negative 5 plus 1x. But I got to tell you, I have to type these in manually. And so, uh, you know, every time um, I do this, there's a possibility I may forget one of these which is why it's always safest just to write it in the most standard form you can, which is y equals mx plus b form, okay? You're not mixing the pieces around a little bit. Um, so um, the, the good news, like I said, is, that, you know, this was a lot going on with that problem, and uh, almost half of you got it right. Uh, uh, 12 out of 25, um, and actually it says that only 18 people did it, so, you know, 67% of you that tried it got it right, but um, if you did, um, that's a three points bonus, and that's why there were some pretty high scores on this quiz. Um, 
I hope that it inspires you to keep trying the bonuses. And next time you, you see a bonus, you know, on the next quiz, you're going to be like, yeah, bring it on, bonus. See what you got. But anyway, um, if you have any further questions on this quiz, let me know. Hope you got something out of, uh, out of going over it. And um, we'll see you on the next quiz.